If we want our robot to interact with the environment, then our robot must be able to sense that environment. Computer vision is one of the most powerful sensing modalities that currently exist. And so in lecture 15, we're going to pivot and start looking at computer vision. We're going to get an overview of that and then focus on how to do segmentation, that is identify which are objects in the scene and which are background. Our reference will be chapter 11 out of Robotic Dynamics and Control. But the basic idea is there's a real world that exists out here. And then we take that and we digitize that and load that into our computer. And then we try to make some calculations on that and figure where objects are and how we should reach them and interact with them. Now, computer vision is a huge topic, so much so that we've got a number of courses. There's a graduate course in computer vision offered in computer science that I can recommend. There are also many textbooks that are out there all about computer vision and just computer vision applied to robotics one of which is written by a leading roboticist named Peter Cork. So here's a picture of Peter Cork and his tiny friend. And actually, of course not, his tiny friend is actually slightly larger than Peter Cork. But this illustrates an important idea in vision. We think that when we get an image, that we're getting a view of this 3D world, but we're not getting the 3D world. All we're getting is a projection of that 3D world down into 2D. And so there's always a loss of information whenever we take an image of what the real 3D world is. And that is something we have to work at. So in our class, we're going to focus on the things that we can solve with trigonometry. And so we're going to focus on camera calibration. How do we tell where coordinates are of the, the camera and objects? We want to see how real world objects are turned into pixel coordinates under our image plane. From that, we want to be able to determine where those real objects really are. In this, we have to calibrate our cameras. There's lots of ways to do calibration. And so there's some excellent ones. I'd recommend the ones with MATLAB. And yeah, they've got a nice tutorial there. We're going to use a simpler method because if you can understand the simpler method, then you'll have insight into what's going on when the other methods use some nonlinear optimization. So in practice, what you do for calibration, you use something called a checkerboard. They look something like this and alternating white and black squares. And then you hold that checkerboard up in front of your camera and take a bunch of camera images. It detects all the intersections of all those black and white squares and uses that to do a bunch of math and then optimize where is your robot located, what is its focal length, what's its orientation. Why we care about this is because we want our robot to interact with things that are in the real world. And so this is a 2D barcode called an April tag. You print it on a piece of paper and put it on a rigid backing, and then you can see where it is. We use these on our underwater robots when we test them at NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab because we want to know where the robots are so that we can perform math on how well we are doing at localizing them. And so in the robot's point of view, we can take this information, which tells us not only the X, Y, Z location of this tag, but also its roll pitch yaw. So you can see this green is always put at the bottom of the tag. From these parameters, we can tell the orientation of that tag. And then we can build a 3D world where we know the 3D location orientation of everything that's labeled with a tag. It's an easy way to cheat on this. If you look at Boston Dynamics videos, their first videos, they usually have a bunch of these tags all over the world because it's an easy way to automatically know where you are. And here's a video uh, that Rema Ike from my lab built using these tags that these little Cosmo robots could find objects in the real world, deform them. Just by measuring the orientation of this deformation, they could tell what stage of the process they were in. And they could do teamwork even with a, a bunch of very simple robots. The model that we're going to use in this class is called a pinhole camera model. And this is something that you could build yourself. You take a cardboard box, put a tiny hole at one side. It actually works better to use something like a sheet of tin foil and put a tiny pinhole through there. Then if you could stick your head in here and make sure that you seal it off so that no light leaks in, then what you would see projected on the back side of that cardboard box would be an inverse image of the real world. Because little photons that bounce off the top of the tree 
The only way to get into your box is through this pinhole. They'll hit the bottom of the box. Little photons from the roots of the tree will go through your pinhole and hit the top of the back of your box. And so you get this inverted image. Now this is kind of confusing in our robotics because then it puts a negative one on our orientations. So often when we translate this image that we do, we'll just imagine that this image plane is actually hovering in front of this pinhole because it gets rid of uh, two negative numbers for us. And so you can see here, although the pinhole is actually right back here, we're going to imagine that the image plane is in front of it. And then there's a number of numbers that we need to use our trigonometry to figure out what they are. What the pinhole does is it models a projective camera with two sub-parameterizations, what's called the intrinsic and the extrinsic parameter. These are just a collection of scalar values that we want to know so we can tell where our camera is and what type of camera it is. So the intrinsic parameters are going to model the optic components. So they're going to be things like the focal length of this and then how wide each of our pixels are and how much they're squished in different dimensions. We are going to model them with linear parameters so we're not going to do things like distortion. A more complicated calibration would be able to handle something like a fisheye lens. The other parameters are the extrinsic parameters which just tell you where is this camera's position, its orientation. And so anytime we're talking about position and orientation, these extrinsic parameters really are just a homogeneous transformation. And that is something that we've studied in detail already. So I've built this little build here. Here's your camera. It's got a pinhole here. That's the only way for light to come in. We've got our image plane that has your CCD array or whatever you're using to process these pixels. And it is a distance lambda. This lambda is called the focal length behind this pinhole. So that's actually what's going on. If we want to talk about where is this camera, we have to put a coordinate frame on this camera. And so we always have Z that's pointing out along our direction of sight. So this Z is pointing outwards, X to the side and Y up. And then there's another coordinate frame called the world frame. And this can be some arbitrary right-handed frame that's out in the world. And the relationship between these tell us how we can get from camera coordinates to real world coordinates. What we do next is we draw a line that goes through this pinhole. It intersects the image plane at a place that we call the principal point. We call the location of the pinhole. That is our center of projection because every light ray is going to go right between that. So if there's some real objects that's out there, if we want to see that on our image plane, that means that we've got little photons that have bounced off that. They go through this center of projection and then they project onto this image plane. Again, this is upside down. That is confusing. But we take a real world point, that is some P at an XYZ location, that is projected down into a UV onto our image plane. So there is no third dimension. It's always just a U and a V there. That's all we can control. It's always going to be a distance lambda behind our center of projection. So again, what we normally do is we just imagine that this image plane is actually in front of our center of projection because then these rays that are coming here are not inverted. And so it's a nice little imaginary trick that we do to make our math slightly easier. And then it's easy to see what happens to one of these pixels. We take our X, Y, Z, and if you look here, everything that's going through here, it's a, a symmetric triangle. And so we're just scaling it by some factor K. So our X times K gives us our U value, our Y times K gives us our V value, and our Z times K equals our lambda value. The extrinsic parameters that we need to know is how do we get from the world coordinates into our camera coordinates. So that's a homogeneous transform. And so right here are these X's, these are 3D coordinates. But to get it in the world frame, well, what you'd have to do is first take your camera frame and rotate it from the camera frame into the world frame and then add that offset. How far do we have to move to get where the origin of the camera is in the world frame? This can all be inverted. So if we want to figure out what XC is, we first we subtract off this OCW from that side and then we multiply it by the inverse of a rotation. And so we can lump these together if we propagate this rotation through and say that this is this our R and our T. What well, this tells us is how we take a point that's in the world frame and transform that into the camera frame. Now that's not the end of the story because we don't actually get an infinite resolution image where we have these UV coordinates. Instead we have to turn them into pixel coordinates. And our optical center is in the middle of this image. Well usually when we count our pixels we're going to start from 0, 0. That's in some corner of our image. And so in order to do this we have to first subtract off where is this optical center which is at some OC, OR in our image. And then we have to change it by the scaling of how wide are our pixels in X and in Y. And in general, they could be different sizes. 
with this rounding here is taking it to the nearest pixel coordinate. And so there is a loss of the infinite precision in the real world into the digital representation that we actually get. So our first assignment is to convert from the camera frame into the image frame. All right, so we're given a camera that has a focal length lambda equals 10, and we want to figure out what are the image plane coordinates for the 3D points whose coordinates in the camera frame are given below. And then I want you to go through here and indicate which points would not be visible to a real camera. I'd prefer if you would work these out yourself and then check against here, but I'm going to give a few pointers to start with, and then I'd like you to pause the video and try to solve these. So first off, let's show where our camera is. So our camera has its optical center right here, and the frame that's attached to that, we always have our Z coming outwards. So this is the Z of the camera, and then we'll have our X and our Y. So this is where the pixel is. The image frame is actually going to be projected behind this, and the distance it's projected behind it is a distance of lambda. However, what we typically imagine is that this frame is in front of it. So this is the imaginary spot where it's lambda in front of that optical center. And so we'll have some coordinates that are in the camera frame. Then we need to translate those into the image frame and how that works. And this point comes in through here. It's going to intersect our plane at this point here. So its coordinates here are going to be some u, v, and then it's always a distance lambda from the center frame, and that's going to correspond to some points which are x, y, z, all in you know, the real world in the camera frame. And so how we convert these is with something which is called the projective transformation. And so this real world coordinates of x, y, z are multiplied by some constant k, and then we get our u, v, and our lambda. And that's easy to see by thinking about uh, a triangle here. So we've got this triangle right here, and there is a symmetric triangle over here where we just multiply all these constants by some scaling factor k you know, times k, and then we get our projection. Now one of the key things we want to do is, so this since this lambda value here is always going to be a constant, we can solve for what k is. So we know that k times zc is equal to lambda, which means that k is equal to lambda divided by zc. And then you can use this same k and you can plug it in for these equations here and you can figure out where the u and the v are. So with that, uh, you can pause the video now and then try to solve these or you can watch how I do the first one and then try to solve the rest. So this first one we have 25, 25, 50 and we want to solve for what is our k first, and then we'll solve for what our uv is. And so we care about this z value, and so our k is going to be lambda divided by zc. So that's going to be 10 divided by 50, so we can put that in simplest terms as 1 fifth, and then we just multiply that through here. So our uv is going to be 1 fifth times 25, and so that is 5 and 5. And this value is, is fine. It is in front of the camera, so that's good. At some point here, 5-5, five, five, and then we'll get one-fifth the size when it's translated over here. I mean, there's 5-5 five, five over here. comes down to, I mean, this is 25, 25, 50, and then it's transformed. It's always going to be at lambda equals 10, but the other things are going to be 5 and 5. So that's a projective transform, and the key thing is that everything is always turned in the same lambda value. Everything gets projected onto this frame, and we lose everything onto there. So let's go ahead and let's do the next ones. So this is also 50, and so we have 10 divided by 50. We again get 1 fifth. This will be at negative 5, negative 5. This next one is at negative 50, so k is going to equal to 10 divided by negative 50. That's negative one-fifth. Now we have a problem here. This one exists, but it's not visible. Because this is a z value that's negative, so it's actually behind this frame. It's somewhere over, over here. And so your camera can't see something that's behind it if it is a pinhole camera. You'd have to have something like a bug-eyed camera. But anyways, if you did multiply that out, then you'd get negative four, negative one. But it's not visible. 
So let's do this next one, which is 25 is its k value, so it's closer than these other ones. So again, we take 10 divided by 25, and we'll get 2 fifths. 2 fifths, we can multiply that through, and we get 6 and 4. This next one, it's at 0, 0, 50. Well, that's not going to be too bad. So 10 divided by 50 is equal to 1 fifth. And we multiply it, we still get 0, 0. And our final one is at 100. Again, 10 divided 100. Now we have 1 tenth. But it's going to be at 0, 0 still. So now we have a different problem. We have coordinates of points that are given with respect to the world frame. And they say, suppose the optical axis is parallel with the world x-axis, camera x-axis is parallel to the world y-axis, and the center of projection has coordinates 0, 0, 100. And so what I like to do for a problem like this is always draw it out first. So we've got our camera, which has got a zc, x, c, y, c. And it says the optical axis is parallel with the world x-axis. We'll draw it in. Maybe we'll have to shift it out here. Optical axis is parallel with x-world. And then the camera x-axis is parallel to the y. y-world. To get a right-handed frame, that means that our z-world is here. And it's saying that the center projection has coordinates 0 along x, 0 along y, and everything along 100. So actually, I'm going to have to take this thing here. I'm going to translate it underneath it because there's 100 units above it. So 100. And now if we want to translate and say, well, where is the xc and the yc? Well, the xc is going to be the same as the yc, y world. The yc in the camera, well, that's going to be equal to the z of the world, but then we have to subtract off this 100 that it is up. And then finally, this zc that we have here, that's going to be the same thing as our x world. So that's our transformation that we have to apply. So first we take our world coordinates, we transform them into the camera matrix, then we figure out what our k is, and then we find out what our uv is. So I'll do the first one, and then you can do the rest. My x is going to be my y value. My y is going to be the z minus 100, so minus 50. And then my z is going to be whatever the x is, so that's 25. And then my k value is 10 divided by my z value here, so that's 2 fifths. And then my uv, I multiply 2 fifths times 25, I get 10. And then 2 fifths times 50, uh, so I get negative 10 times negative 20. So now I've done my first one. We'll switch my colors so we can see the next one. I'd like you to pause the video and see if you can solve the rest, and then you can just compare it with my answers. Anyway, we've got negative 25, negative 25. So my x is going to be my y value. So that'll be negative 25. My y value is going to be my z value minus 100, minus 50. And then my z value, zc, is equal to xc, so that's negative 25. So now it'll have a negative 2 fifths. Is this value negative 2 fifths? Well, that means that it's invisible. This point is actually behind my camera. I can still multiply that out of where it would be if I had an impossible camera. And I get Now I've got my next one, 25, negative 50. And so my x value is going to be my y. So I get 5. And then my y value is z world minus, that's a minus 150. And then my z value is my x world. So that's a 20. And so I have 10 divided by 20 is my k value. That's going to be 1 half. So this is going to be at 2.5 and 75, or negative 75, as it's projected down. The next one, 15, 10, 25. Well, my x value is going to be my y. My y value is going to be my z value minus 100, so negative 75. 
my z value is the x value, so I get 15 there. And so I have 10 divided by 15 is equal to 2 thirds. Oh, it doesn't have a nice fraction. 20 thirds, negative 50. So we're okay there. The next value is at 0, 0, 50. xc is going to be my y world value. And my y is going to be my z world, so that's minus 50. My z value is my x world, so that's a 0. So since it's 0, this is saying that this point is right at my optical center. So either it's invisible or <laughs> it's only thing. The only thing you can see because it's sitting right in there. In any case, my k value is 10 divided by 0. So all I can see in this frame is this. It's, actually, it's right on top of my camera's pinhole. <laughs> you know, not a number. Not a number. It's blocking up my camera. So the next one is at 0, 0, 100. So we'll do this one again. And we've got our x value is 0. And then I take my z value minus 100, and I get a 0. And then my x value here is going to also be 0. And so again, I get a 10 divided by 0. So this one is also invisible only thing, or only thing. That's all we see. We get not a number, not a number. And there we've done that. So you've been working very hard in this class. I would like to end today's lecture with a favorite children's story. I get to read children's stories to my boys every night before they go to sleep. And this is one about optics that I find delightful. So if you've never heard it before, enjoy it. But it's all about a little boy named Harold who has a purple crayon. I want a picture to put on my wall, said Harold. He drew a house with his purple crayon. More houses made a little town. It was far away. The town had woods and hills around it, and it was at the end of a long road. It will look pretty in the moonlight, said Harold, and he stepped up into the picture to draw the moon. Skip a few pages. He just missed an airplane. And so he says, There might have been a bad accident. Harold found a low place in the mountains. It was a good place for a railroad to go through. It came out onto a long, flat field. Harold put some birds and flowers near the tracks. People like to see things from trains, he said. He went on drawing tracks and birds and flowers, and he had to keep looking out for trains. It was a big job for a small boy. All of a sudden he saw how small he had become. He was half the size of a daisy. He was smaller than a bird. How would he get home? He could not wade home through the ocean. He could not climb those high mountains. And just then, he fell into a mouse hole. Excuse me, he said to the mouse. Then Harold sat down on a pebble to think. After a minute or two, he stood up again. This is only a picture, he said, and he took his Koran and he crossed it out. I am not big or little. I am my usual size. But how could he be sure about that? At home he was always his usual size, so he drew the door of his room. There was a long mirror at the back of the door. Yes, said Harold, I am my usual size. And so ends our lecture today. I hope you enjoy digging into computer vision.